and welcome to this next lecture. I believe this is lecture four. I could be wrong. We're going to talk about contrasts today. Um, it's going to cover sections 651, 652, and 653 in the textbook. 651 covers contrasts in general. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. 652 talks about a specific type of contrast called an orthogonal, con orthogonal contrast. Orthogonal contrasts are good because it does add one little benefit, and that is that the alpha level is protected. And 653 is going to be about trend analysis, which also deals kind of with orthogonal contrasts. But it does add one important use. So far, we've been assuming that our independent variable is nominal. If our independent variable is ordinal, we may ask questions about, well, as the independent variable increases, does the measurement go up linearly? Does it go up quadratically, cubically, whatever? Trend analysis will allow us to look at that. So that's the overview of what we're going to cover. So let's go ahead and get started with contrasts. All right, let's begin this lecture, uh, lecture number four on contrasts. Um, the way that we're using contrasts here is they're a type of pre-planned hypothesis test. Um, I'm emphasizing the pre-planned part here. What we did in the last lecture was post hoc. They were, we had no idea what we should be testing. We tested the, the the, the average in all the groups, we discovered that the averages weren't the same, therefore we wanted to learn more about which was different. That was post-talk. Pre-planned is we go into this with the idea of, okay, I want to test if, perhaps, the first group's average is the same as the average of the other three groups put together. Or the first group is greater than the second group and the third group put together. Those are pre-planned because the science is telling us that those are interesting things to test before we even start the analysis of variance. The post hoc tests that we did in the last lecture are for, okay, we did the analysis of variance and now we're going to learn some more about the relationships. Pre-planned is we go into this with those hypotheses. So let's go to the meat bacteria example. Let's go ahead and do the following hypothesis. It should look familiar to some of us. What this hypothesis is, is that the average for the CO2, the average log count of bacteria, for the CO2 packaging is equal to the average, add 2 divided by 2, equal to the average log count bacteria for the mixed gases and the plastics put together. I don't find this question interesting, but then I don't really think much about the packaging process for my meat. If you think about pack pack packaging processes for your meat, this may be interesting to you. Notice that eventually we're going to have to get this into the format of L equal to zero. And, and L is going to be a linear combination. The L is for linear. Linear combination of all of our means. To get this, we just move everything onto one side. And because I hate fractions, I'm going to multiply it through by 2. So this is going to be mu c, uh, actually 2 mu c, minus mu m, minus mu p, equals 0. And if I want to belabor the point, remember there is the vacuum plus 0 times mu v. I want to involve every one of those four different levels. This is our null hypothesis. It's exactly the same as our original. We're just writing it in a special way. And this part is our L. Is our L. So linear combination of the means of the different levels. Again, L for linear combination. Now in all of our testing, we need to estimate L. L is population. How do we know L is population? Because it's based on other population parameters. We put a hat on it if we're going to observe that value. In this case, what we observe, well, what did we observe for mu sub c? Right? We observed the y bar sub c. Okay. 
What did we observe for mu sub m? Y bar sub m. What did we observe for mu sub p? Y bar sub p. And what do we observe for mu sub v, the vacuum average? Well, don't really care because we're multiplying by zero, but That's what we observed. This is what we hypothesize. This is what we observe. This is what we hypothesize. We can actually calculate this, because this is now based on our sample. Y bar sub c. Do I have those numbers somewhere? Yes. What we actually observed is 2 times, and y bar sub c was 7, oh wait, 7.26. Y bar sub m is 3.36. Y bar sub p is 7.48. And y bar sub v is 5.50. But since I'm multiplying by 0, that's going to be added to 0. So what we observe for L hat It's going to require a calculator. It's going to be 2 times 7.26 minus 3.36 minus 7.48. Notice what we observe is not equal to what we hypothesize. It rarely is. I mean, at this point, you may want to be thinking back to our one sample t-test back in introductory statistics. We hypothesized that the mean was equal to zero. We took some measurements and found out that the mean was not zero. Big deal. The question is, from a statistician's standpoint, is this far enough away from zero that we conclude that it can't be zero? In order to do that, we have to know the distribution of our test statistic. So I'm going to write this number over on the side. Because we're going to need that information eventually. So the next step is to find the distribution of this L hat. Just as before, we had to find the distribution of our T statistic, or last lecture, we had to find the distribution of, well, two lectures ago, we had to find the distribution, three lectures ago, we had to find the distribution of F. Here, we're going to have to find the distribution of L hat. We know this is the definition of L hat. So the name of the distribution, well, L hat depends on y bar sub c, y bar sub m, y bar sub p, y bar sub v. What's the distribution of y bar sub c? Well, what is the distribution of y bar, uh, I'm sorry, what is the distribution of y sub c? What's the distribution of y sub m, y sub p, y sub v? By assumption, it's normal. If the, y, if the y c's are normal, then the y bar sub c's are normal. I mean, hey, even if the y sub c's aren't normal, as long as the sample size within the c group is large enough, the y bar sub c is going to be close to normal. So this is normal or approximately normal. 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 The sum of normal distributions is normal. Normal distribution has two parameters, the expected value and the variance. What is the expected value of L hat? Well, this is L hat. The expected value of L hat is the expected value of everything on the right. It's equal to 2 times the expected value of y bar c minus the expected value of y bar m 
minus the expected value of y bar p plus 0 times the expected value of y bar v. Well, what is the expected value of y bar c? Right, it's mu sub c. And what is the expected value of y bar sub m? It's mu sub m. Expected value of y bar p? Yeah, it's mu sub p. Because sample means are unbiased estimators of the population mean. Second parameter for the normal distribution is the variance. I'll go ahead and write this out over there on the right side. We just did some substitution there, nothing special. One of the assumptions was that the data are independent, which means that the variance can now decompose all three of these. That step only works if they're independent. So we've just used the independence assumption. And that's why it's an important assumption. Variance is a squaring procedure. And where the formula for variance is y i minus y bar squared added up n minus 1. It's a squaring procedure. So if we're pulling this 2 out, we have to square the 2. 2 squared is 4. This is a negative 1. What's a negative 1 squared? Good. Positive 1. Pull this negative 1 out. Negative 1 squared is also positive 1. Boom. So far, so good. What's the variance of y bar sub c? Remember what the bar is? It's, a, it's the mean. Variance of the mean. Remember back when you were first shown the central limit theorem? You were asked to find the variance of probably x bar, and that was the variance of x over n. You would have written this as sigma squared over n. Remember that sigma squared, it's going to come back. So that's the first one. Technically, this should be n sub y. But we've assumed that the, this is a balanced design, which means all the sample sizes and all the groups is equal. So n sub y, or n, plus variance of, that should be c. Uh, ym over n. Again, these n's are the same because we assumed a, a balanced design. Plus the variance of yp over n. Now we could factor out the n's. We're going to do that eventually, but not yet. What is the variance of y sub c? What is the variance of y sub m? What is the variance of y sub p? What was our other assumption of this analysis of variance design? We assumed normality, which we used here. We assumed independence, and we assumed equal variances. That means that this variance is equal to this variance is equal to this variance. Okay. 
and there we use the other assumption, the assumption of equal variances. That's also why we needed that assumption. Now we can factor sigma squared out, and this is going to equal 6 sigma squared over n. Sigma squared over n should look kind of familiar to us by now. Where did this 6 come from? Trace it back. The 6 was 4 plus 1 plus 1. The 4 came from 2 squared. The 1 came from negative 1 squared. And the other 1 came from negative 1 squared. Where did the 2, the negative 1, and the negative 1 come from? 2, negative 1, negative 1. Came from our contrast. 2, negative 1, negative 1. So this 6, we could actually figure out what that 6 is all the way back from our initial contrast. 2 squared plus negative 1 squared plus negative 1 squared. 4 plus 1 plus 1 is our 6. So there is our distribution of L hat. Sure looks like a one sample t test to me. sure you know where all those parts come from. They're pretty important. We don't know what mu sub c, mu sub m, and mu sub p is, but according to our null hypothesis, I don't need to write that up there, this first part is equal to what? Zero. So we're testing that L hat equals zero given that L hat is distributed normal with variance of six times sigma squared over n. We know n, we know six. According to our null hypothesis, we know what this is. Only thing we don't know is sigma squared but we have an estimator for sigma squared. The estimator that we're going to use for sigma squared is the mean squared error, what our book calls the mean squared within. As we recall from our one sample t-test, when we use an estimator, an unbiased estimator for sigma squared, we go from using a z-test to using our t-test. So the test statistic, T, is going to be what we observe for L in general. It's going to be what we observe for L minus what we hypothesize for L divided by the square root of this variance when we substitute in the mean squared error. And that 6 is specific to this case. So in general, what would that 6 be? Where those a's are the coefficients of our linear combination null hypothesis. My goodness, that's a t-test. We can do that in our sleep. That's awesome. I mean, this is contrasts. Note one requirement for contrast, or the way that we formulated it, the way that we formulated it. One of the consequences is L is a contrast if, and only if, 
the sum of those a sub i is equal to 0. Be careful, this is a sub i squared. So these are always going to be positive. These will be mixtures of positives and negatives. So let's check if this is a contrast. If this is a contrast. Adding up all the coefficients, seeing if it comes to 0. So 2 plus negative 1 plus negative 1 plus 0, it's a contrast. What would be a not contrast? That would not be a contrast. Because when you go through this, this will be a 4 and a negative 1 and a negative 1, and that doesn't add to 0. But now it's a contrast. Always double check that you're working with contrasts. If not, then nothing that we just did is going to work. So let's go ahead and look at this t test statistic a little bit closer. It's a t distribution. It follows a t distribution. T distributions require a number of degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom will that follow? As you can probably guess by now, the number of degrees of freedom are going to follow the number of degrees of freedom for the mean squared error. n minus t. Now the book takes this to the next step. The book also hates the square root, hates writing the square root, it takes time to write it. So this, book squares that t. So instead of just t, now the book wants to call this t squared. That's going to equal l hat minus l squared all over square uh, a i squared m s e over n. That's all it did. Since you're now squaring t, it follows a different distribution. And here's why the book likes to do this. This now follows an f distribution book really likes to keep all analysis variance things in terms of the F distribution, whenever possible. This is going to have two types of degrees of freedom, numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. Numerator degrees of freedom here is going to be 1. Denominator degrees of freedom is going to be n minus t. So instead of calling this t squared, we could call this f. which is actually kind of important because f is a ratio of variances which means we can reformulate this into a ratio of two variances mean squared error on the bottom and what goes on top everything else book decides to call that numerator mean squared contrast. L for contrast. Boom. So that's the mean squared contrast. This is the symbol for it. And what distribution does this follow? F distribution. Same, exactly the same because we've got equality here. F distribution with one degree of freedom in the numerator and minus t degrees of freedom in the denominator. Let's use that. Going backwards. 
review what the analysis variance table showed us. That if you want to get to the mean squared blah, that's going to equal to the sum of squared blah divided by the degrees of freedom blah blah blah. Obviously here with the mean squared error, it's going to be the sum of squared error divided by the degrees of freedom error. Mean squared contrast is going to equal sum of squared contrast divided by the degrees of freedom contrast. How do we know degrees of freedom error was n minus t? How do we know the, sum of, uh, the degrees of freedom for the contrast was 1? Divided by 1 doesn't do anything special. And so the book points out that the mean squared contrast and the sum of squared contrast are the same. There's one more simplification that the book does. And it kind of actually helps quite a bit. Almost always, we're testing if L is equal to 0. In the example we just had about five minutes ago, we were testing L equals 0. So we can put 0 in here for L. Or we can just erase it. And what is this L hat? This is a linear combination. The L again is for linear combination of the mu's, or I'm sorry, L hat is going to be a linear combination of the x bars, or y bars. And so that's where the book gets that formula. star, however, I think that's the most important formula up here. The rest of this just shows us some interesting relationships amongst all the, all the variables that we're looking at here. So let's look at this for, again for a moment. The a sub i are our multipliers from our null hypothesis, our pre-planned null hypothesis. The y bar sub i's are the observed sample means in each of the groups. n is the common sample size within the groups. Again, this, this assumes that everything that we've done assumes a balanced design. That the number of obser observations in each group is the same, and it's equal to little n. And the difference between what we observe and what we hypothesize in terms of this variation is an f, one numerator, numerator degree of freedom, and n minus t, denominator degrees of freedom. And remember, this n minus t is the degrees of freedom for the error. And again, remember that the book doesn't use MSE, it uses MF, MSW. So every E you see up here, the book would like you to use, those are the only E's, W. Just about every other source, however, calls it MSE. So that's contrast. That's the introduction to contrasts. Again, I do want to emphasize this is for pre-planned hypothesis testing. OK, let's remember this over on the right. Let's go ahead and do the testing. And the amusing thing is I go back to the T instead of to the F. Okay, we observe what for L hat? So our observed test statistic is 3.68. What do we hypothesize for L? Zero. In the denominator? The sum of the AI squared was 6. The mean squared error is the same as it has been for the for this, this product. Uh, where was that? Here it is. Uh, meat bacteria example, the mean squared error was somewhere on here. 
we go, it's trying to remember. And n is 3. And this is going to be distributed according to a t distribution with how many degrees of freedom? 8. Same as it has been over the last couple lectures. So let's do this calculation to get a number. Assuming that I did the calculations correctly, usually not a safe assumption. So this is what we observe. The critical value for t of alpha is 0 0.05, but it's going to be alpha over 2. And degrees of freedom 8 from our textbook, back of the book, table A2. trouble with this. There we go. T distribution, degrees of freedom, 8, 0, 2, 5, 2.3060. Okay. What we observed is more extreme than our critical value. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. We reject the null hypothesis that the average, what was the null hypothesis? Um, that the average of mixed and plastic was the same as the average of CO2 in terms of log count bacteria, I think. Double check what the null hypothesis was. Calculating p values beyond the scope of this course, but straightforward because this, again, I want to emphasize this is just a one sample t test. That's all there is to this. It is just a one sample t test. But we're comparing different things. We're comparing L hat instead of x bar. So reject the null hypothesis. And that's it. That's it for this right now. The next thing we're going to look at are called orthogonal contrasts. Notice we have just one null hypothesis. If we have another null hypothesis, in general, we're going to have a multiple comparisons issue. See the last lecture. Which means that we have to do some sort of adjustment. In that case, we'd have to use a Chaffee adjustment. If we use orthogonal contrasts, we don't have to do any adjustment. So let's move on to orthogonal contrasts. Orthogonal contrasts. Remember, L is a contrast, and a subscript at one because we're going to have to be dealing with two different contrasts or maybe three different contrasts. L1 is a contrast if it's equal to a linear combination of the mu's. Or of the y bars, it doesn't matter. L2 is a contrast for the same reason. It was a linear combination of the mu's. Those mu's are the same between the two contrasts because we're in the same problem. The a's and the b's could be different. They may be the same. If they're the same, then obviously if one's a contrast, the other's got to be a contrast. So L1 and L2 are contrasts. I'm sorry, are orthogonal orthogonal trasts if the following is true. Multiply all the A B pairs. Add them all up. If it equals zero, you've got orthogonal contrasts. 
And again, I want to emphasize the reason you may want orthogonal contrasts, orthogonal contrasts, wow, is because if you have hypothesis associated with L1 and a hypothesis associated with L2, and the L1 and L2 are orthogonal contrasts, then you don't have to do any adjustment to control for your type 1 error rate. It naturally controls itself. If the contrasts are not orthogonal, then you're going to have to use a Chaffee adjustment, which is not a horrible thing. We're doing all of this on a computer eventually. Doing a Chaffee adjustment just requires typing in six letters. S-C-H-E-F-F-E. -F -F -E. Okay, seven letters. Wow. Adjustment. But back in the day when we were doing this by hand, orthogonal contrasts were important. Now, instead of focusing on orthogonal contrasts and ensuring that our contrasts are orthogonal, we focus on, con on contrasts that are of interest to us as scientists, which is a good place to be as scientists, especially. So, I'm going to give an example of two contrasts, and then we're going to walk through to see if they are or are not orthogonal. So, boom. Remember, this is the key, so make sure this is written down in your book. So, our first null hypothesis is that mu c is equal to the average of mu m and mu p. I think that was the same hypothesis we had before. The second null hypothesis is going to be, I have one prepared, oh, going to be, this is a boring one, that mu for the vacuum, the average for the vacuum, average log count bacteria for the vacuum group is equal to the average of all the others. That's kind of boring, but hey. So, now the question is, are these two hypothes hypotheses orthogonal? Well, what is L1? Remember, we've got to put all of this on one side, set it equal to zero, and I like to get rid of the fractions. So multiply by through, but multiply through by two, and move these two over on the right, or left. This is two and mu c minus mu m minus mu p plus zero mu b and that's what we had in the last example. Let's do the same for the next one. L2 is equal to again multiply through by three and move everything to one side and I'm going to actually line them up because eventually we're going to have to multiply through. So multiply both sides by three that gives us three mu b Um, minus mu c, minus mu m, minus mu p. So let's strip it of all of the mu's. So this is equal to 2, negative 1, negative 1, 0. And this is equal to negative 1, negative 1 negative 1, 3. So A1 is 2, A2 is negative 1, A3 is negative 1, A4 is 0. B1 is negative 1, B2 is negative 1, B3 is negative 1, B4 is 3. So to, to determine if these contrasts are orthogonal, we have to multiply A1 and B1, multiply a2 and B2, multiply A3 and B3, multiply A4 and B4, and add those products together. So 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. 0 times 3 is 0. And add these together. They're orthogonal. Which means we can test the first null hypothesis, doing exactly what we just did. We can test the second null hypothesis, doing the same steps as we just did. And we don't have to adjust the p-values at the end. 
If these were not orthogonal, we'd have to adjust the p-values at the end. We'd have to use the Chappé adjustment from the last lecture. So let me give some examples of two, hypo, hy, two contrasts that are not orthogonal. I'll keep the L1. Mu, pulling this out of the air, and I will laugh if these turn out to be orthogonal. There we go. We'll go with this one. So the first, uh, first null hypothesis is that mu c is equal to the average of mu m and mu p. The second is that mu m equals mu v. That the average for the mixed gases is equal to the average for the vacuum. Okay. So L2, again, solve this for zero by moving everything on one side. Uh, this is equal to zero mu c plus mu m plus zero mu p minus mu v. Gotta be in the same order. C M P V C M P V. So now V sub 1 is 0, V sub 2 is 1, V sub 3 is 0, V sub 4 is negative 1. So again, to determine if these contrasts are orthogonal, multiply A1 and B1, multiply A2 and B2, multiply A3 and B3, multiply A4 and B4. And then you've got that summation sign to take care of, so we add them together. Since that is not equal to zero, these two contrasts are not orthogonal. And we need to use the Chaffe method from the last lecture. If these were orthogonal, we'd be able to just use the t-test method that we learned today. But they're not. So we have to use Chaffe. And then I could show you how to actually determine if, uh, how to test this L2. But that's exactly the same as we did when we were talking about contrast, so there's really no need to. So this little section of Lecture 4 is just introducing what an orthogonal contrast is and why it's important. Orthogonal contrast, two or contrasts are orthogonal if the cross product, or I'm sorry, if the inner product of their coefficients is zero. And it's important because if two contrasts are orthogonal, there's no need to adjust the p-value to take into consideration the multiple comparisons. If they're not, then you do. Okay, the last mini topic for today is trend analysis. And I gotta be fast because my camera is running out of battery. Usually my phone runs out of battery, but now it's my camera. Trend analysis is used, there we go. Trend analysis is used when your independent variable is ordinal. So far, it's, we've always dealt with the thought of them as being nominal. That is, the order doesn't matter. Trend analysis can be used if, if order does matter, if there is a definite ordering to that independent variable, to that grouping. Uh, this happens frequently in dosing um, or in the example that I've got. Independent variable. Dependent. Independent variable is going to be the distance I run. Now I don't keep track exactly of how far I run, but I know that one lap around is about a mile. I don't always finish one lap around. Sometimes I go a little bit more, but I count that as a quote one mile, or I'm sorry, a 1.2 mile run. Uh, a couple laps around is two miles, or it's not exactly two, so I, I think of it as kind of a two mile or a class of two mile runs, and then 3.1 and 6.2, the same thing. Notice already that these are ordered. And this is the order, in increasing order. And also notice that this is not exactly 1.2 miles. It's 1.2 in that, in that area. 
and this is about two miles or so, and this is somewhere around 5K, and this is somewhere around 10K. So don't think of these as absolute measurements, that is, don't think of these as numeric. Think of these more as classes. And the dependent variable is going to be my pace. Pace is measured in minutes per mile. Obviously, I'm not bragging here. Um, so this would be eight and a half minutes per mile, this would be eight minutes 48 seconds per mile, this would be eight minutes 42 seconds per mile. Recent trend analysis would be interesting here is I really don't care if one or more is different. That's really not interesting to me. I mean, I'm pretty sure that one or more of these averages is different from the others. What's interesting is to know if I, if the farther I run, the slower I, the farther I run, the slower I run. That would be interesting. In other words, this is a first look at trying to do regression where one of the variables is categorical. So this would be at or 1.2, this would be at 2, this would be at 5.1, this would be 6.2. Notice that these distances on the graph are the same even though the distance in terms of numbers are not. And again, that's because these aren't numbers, these are categories. And just as we've done with categorical data, we plot it. Up until now, if these were nominal, all we could test is if there's a difference and how much things differ. But since these have an order to them, we can also test things such as, do they increase linearly? We can also test, is there a quadratic increase in here? Um, there's four, so we can go up to a third degree polynomial. We could say, okay, is there a, a cubic aspect to this? And this is the purpose of trend analysis, to be able to utilize the additional Sorry about that, camera ran out of battery. So, contrast. Three types of contrast that we get, uh, three types of trends that we can examine here. And we can only do three because there's four points. Now you can only do trends, degree of trends up to the number of categories minus one. Four minus one is three, so we can only go up to cubic. Now this is kind of neat. Um, you're going to want to look at cable, uh, table A6 for this. Um, so go ahead and open up A6, uh, pause, of course. Now you're back. So if I want to test all three of those contrasts, or all three of those trends, we need to um, look at table A6, which is rather difficult to read. And we have to create the following, L1 for linear, L2 for quadratic, L3, the following sets of contrast. So for the linear, it's going to be negative 3 times, we'll call this 1, 2, 3, and I guess 6. Yeah. Uh, mu1, linear, so minus 1, mu2, plus 1, mu3 plus 3 mu4. Now how did I get that? I went to the part in table A6 that said t equals 4. Four groups. And then the first column, negative 3, negative 1, 1, 3, that's for the linear contrasts. Boom. Second column is 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, that's for the quadratic contra contrasts. So 
that contrast will test for a quadratic change. And then the third column is one, negative 1, 3, negative 3, 1. And that will test for the cubic contrast. And now that we have our contrasts, we know they're orthogonal because they were created that way. That's why you've got threes here to ensure that everything's orthogonal. Um, so, so now we have orthogonal contrasts. We go back to the last part. Well, we really don't need to. All that the last part told us was if we have orthogonal contrasts, we don't need to adjust the p-value. And if we're doing it by hand, we can go back to the first part of this lecture, calculating the contrast. So this will be, you'll calculate an L1 hat do a t-test with L1 hat equaling 0. You'll calculate an L2 hat, L3 hat, each of those t-tests with L equals 0. Pretty straightforward. So here's where you go at this point. R people go to the R, SAS people go to the SAS, and we're actually going to fit this in our respective programs. Just to show you that it's pretty straightforward. So thank you very much. On to the computer.